This is the Mason Vera Pain Show, your go-to lifestyle program covering everything from technology and gaming to movies, TV shows, and pop culture to the supernatural and beyond. Brought to you from Chicago, USA. With your host, the unabridged millennial, Mason Vera Payne. Mason Vera Payne here live from the NVP studios in Chicago, and thank you for tuning in. Nowadays, more than ever, people want to know their genealogy and ancestry. The process may sound long and drawn out, but it's actually not. Scientist and genealogist Roberta Estes breaks down the science of genealogy. Thanks for joining me, Roberta. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to you about genetic genealogy today. Could you tell me, how did you get into this? How did you get into genealogy? Well, genealogy I got into when I was actually pregnant for my daughter a long time ago because I, I didn't know anything about my family, and I was curious, and I had a little bit of time on my hands. Uh, but genetic genealogy, where you tie genetics with genealogy, um, that began about 20 years ago, and I was already a, gene- a hobby genealogist. And I had a computer science degree, and science and genetics and genealogy all just kind of came together, and I started using them, all three, to solve my family history questions. Now, you hear this interchanged a lot, genealogy and ancestry, but is there a difference? Yeah, there is, and that's actually a really good question. And I had to think about that a little bit uh, when I saw these two words, because everybody has ancestry or heritage, because whether you know it or not, it's there. You might not know what it is, but you have it, right? I mean, you have ancestors, they have stories, and their choices that they made in the generation before and the one before that and the one before that all affect where you wound up today. So genealogy is pursuing that history. It's the pursuit of the discovery of who those ancestors were and where they were born and what their stories are that helped make you the person you are where you were born. Wow, I like that explanation. <laughs> and, you know, it's a combination, too, because there's oral history, you know, what your family tells you, the stories, and sometimes they change. You know, like your grandpa will tell you one thing and then his brother will tell you the same story. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not the same thing, you know? So oral history is like that old telephone game where, you, you know, you have a, a, a whole um, a string of kids and you whisper something in the ear of one on one end and then the last child, you know, 20 kids later, repeats what they heard and it's not at all what started. So that's kind of how our family oral history is. So we take our oral history and then we use records like census and other things we call paper trail, birth records, death records, obituary, all different kind of records. And now we take genetics and we do DNA testing and we tie all those three together in a marriage and that documents and confirms uh, we find our ancestors, we confirm those stories, and we document that they actually are our ancestors with genetics and we find out where they came from. Now you hear about 23andMe a lot and Ancestry.com. Like those are the two biggest ones, DNA companies that you hear up a lot of. So are there any other ones, though? Yeah, there's actually uh, four main ones uh, in the uh, genealogy uh, sector. Um, 23andMe uh, wasn't, wasn't the first one at all. It was the second, actually. Uh, and they focus on health and research. And um, they were primarily a health company. And they actually got into genealogy because they knew that genealogists would DNA test and then they could, you know, they had more people for their health aspect. Uh, and because of that, they don't do things like they don't support family trees and there's no records research there. Um, family Tree DNA was the first company uh, of the four. It started uh, 20 years ago in the year 2000. And they're known as the science company. Um, they have uh, academic partnerships. They test three different kinds of DNA, which is different than the other companies who only test one kind. Um, and um, they, they work in a, in a bit of a different way. We'll talk about them in, in a minute. Um, then we have uh, Ancestry, which was the third company to start testing. And they have a very large database because they have so many people here in the U.S. that to do research. So they kind of had a captive audience. They started selling autosomal DNA um, testing. 
So um, they have uh, a, a very large database, so you'll have a lot of matches there, but they don't provide segment information like the others do, which are, are how you are related to other people. And then the fourth one is MyHeritage. And they're an Israeli company, but they've sold um, into the American and European marketplaces for many, many years. And they are kind of like Ancestry. They have records, genealogical records, in addition to DNA testing, where Family Tree DNA and 23andMe don't have genealogy records like census and birth and death. They're just um, DNA. So MyHeritage has tools that bring all those things together, and they accept transfers as does uh, Family Tree DNA from both Ancestry and 23andMe. And so all of these different companies do testing. Some of them accept transfers from the other, and they all have a strong area, and, and they each have some weaknesses too. So what really serious genealogists do is we either make sure we test at all of them or we test at the two you have to test at who don't accept transfers and then transfer to the other two because we want to be on all those databases because you never know who's there that you're going to match. It's going to be have a, a real key for you. In fact, I just matched somebody this week, and it turns out I had a picture of his grandmother as a child, and we would never have found that. And he had a picture of her father that I'd never seen. I'd never seen a picture of this man. So I had something of his for him, and he had something for me, and we met because our DNA match. That's beautiful. And you're finding family everywhere using these DNA matches. Oh, it is. It's amazing what you can find. Now, when it comes to family tree DNA, I'm not going to lie, I Googled all kinds of places, and it kept taking me back to family tree DNA as being one of the more accurate of the four. Is that true? It is true. Accuracy is kind of a combination of multiple things. First of all, it's the question you're asking, okay? And it's the product that you purchase, and it's the actual processing. So first of all, I'm just going to get the processing part out of the way, okay? Because that's really straightforward. All four of those companies that I mentioned, their, their labs, their processing is fine, their labs are fine. The, the quality of the actual DNA processing is unquestionably accurate. What isn't the same is after the DNA is processed in the lab is the interpretation of it. So by that, I mean that it's like you have raw data when you're done. Well, if you don't use it to match to somebody and it's not interpreted in some way, then it's not useful to you. It's just like a bunch of you know numbers laying there on your desk and you can't do anything with them. The power of it is in matching other people and is in combining it with records. And Family Tree DNA has three separate products, and the others only have one. The other companies have autosomal DNA only, and Family Tree DNA has autosomal plus Y and mitochondrial. And the difference is that Y DNA tracks only one line, and if you're male, it, it's the Y chromosomes. So only um, males have a Y chromosome. They get it from their father. So the Y chromosome allows your, you to look at matches only to your father's paternal line. So it's a laser shot straight back in time, and it's not constrained by generation. It can, it can look straight back as far as you can go, back you know, across the Americas, into Asia, into Europe, wherever you're from. Mitochondrial does exactly the same thing for your mother's line. Uh, everybody has mitochondrial DNA, men and women both. You inherit it from your mother. Only women pass it on. So if you test your mitochondrial DNA, that's your mother's, 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 mother's line. Laser focus straight down that line as far back as you go. The other DNA, the autosomal DNA, is, is DNA that you get from all of your ancestors. But the problem is, is that you only get half as much as your parents had because you get half of each of your parents' DNA. And they only get half of their parents' DNA. So in every generation, it's cut in half. So by the time you're back, maybe, you know, six, eight, ten generations, the pieces are so small, they're very hard to associate with a specific ancestor. So it's broad but not deep. 
and why in mitochondrial is deep and not broad. But the three of them together are an amazing, amazing package of information, especially because, for example, you have your mother's mitochondrial, I have my mother's mitochondrial, but my brother would have my father's Y DNA, and my father would have um, his father's Y DNA, but his mother's mitochondrial. So you can find other people in your family that carry the Y and mitochondrial DNA of your different ancestors and test them for that information, and that provides information about your ancestors that you can't find using autosomal. Now, I like watching a lot of cop shows, and one of the things I like to to see is one of the shows on ID Discovery, they use, like, DNA to solve crimes. And Mm -hmm. sometimes, like, they'll take the cases in the 80s when DNA was just, like, in its infancy, and it'll say, like, hey, this the they only had one strain left, and if this was the last test they could take, and after this, the criminal may get away. Is that true anymore? Is there can can we only use the DNA a certain amount of times? Then boom, it just disintegrates. I can't use it anymore. Well, yeah, that is true. Now, testing DNA testing today has advanced dramatically from the 1980s, not only in terms of the processing but in terms of the comparison ability that we have, that we can do. But if, once you're out of DNA, once it's gone, there's nothing you can do to recover it once it truly is gone. But we can use, they used to say that you needed, um, for example, a blood stain or a semen size for a, a violent crime the size of a quarter. Well, that's not true anymore. You know, that's not true at all. You, you can use something the size of a pinhead. It's a matter of, you know, advances in technology that's happened since the 1980s. And one of the things that today is they're now going back and, you know, processing things like rape kits and, you know, violent crimes um, that were not able to be solved um, back in the 1980s or potentially even earlier. That's amazing what they can do with DNA now. I mean, just mm-hmm. you, you're breathing and your DNA is going on to the surface of stuff because the mists mm-hmm. of little, you know, saliva everywhere. I think that's uh, mm-hmm. incredible how much of yourself is in a small place and you don't even know it. <laughs> that's true. We shed it all the time, every place. And the reason I bring this up is because, you know, taking something that small, how far back can you go? Do you, like trace through your lineage? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because... Um, it depends on which kind of DNA. So I want to talk about the three different kinds a little bit separately. Um, the y, let's start with Y DNA because men really like their Y DNA because it's their surname, right? And men get like really attached to their surname. Um, and it, it's kind of funny because this is patrilineal. And in, in our culture in the U.S., men take their father's surname typically. But in in places like uh, Scandinavia, that's not what happens. Like, the reason there's the word Johnson is it's literally John's son. And then if your uh, your name is something else, like William, if you become William's son. So the name changes in every generation. And it's also that way in Spanish cultures, where men take their they take two surnames. They take their father's surname as their first surname and their mother's surname as their second surname. So every generation in historical records, not necessarily today, but in historical records, the male surname changes on every generation too. So we can look back genetically very far in time with Y-DNA and also mitochondrial. So let's say, and in fact, in, in my line, My ancestor, uh, Nicholas Estes, except it wasn't spelled Estes back then, um, was born in 1495 in Deal, England. Well, the Estes men who are born today can take a Y DNA test, and because we have descendants of that man in England through multiple sons, so we know that it's the same DNA, the men today can say, yes, I matched the Estes line back in England, so I know but that's actually my ancestral line. That's how, with Y and mitochondrial DNA both, we can trace it really far back in time. But at some point, the records run out. There's no more church records. 
But why a mitochondrial DNA has something called a haplogroup? And that haplogroup is something, think of it as a genetic clan. And it can take us even farther back in time because it, they have a migration path. And we can track their mutations back in time so we can track them backwards. In fact, um, one of your family members took a Y-DNA test. And or what, or I'm assuming it's your family member. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was one of your producers. But anyway, we have a tester. And that person's haplogroup is something called EM35. Now, I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but here's what it tells me. I can look at a map at Family Tree DNA, and they have all kinds of maps. They have a migration map and haplogroup maps and all different kinds of tools. They have about 10 Y-DNA tools. And I know that EM35 comes from North Africa and the Mediterranean into Spain. In fact, we call it the Berber haplogroup as a kind of a nickname because of the invasions from North Africa up into Morocco and into Spain. And that's where we find haplogroup EM35. So the, the surname of that person is irrelevant after records run out, wherever they are, but we know where they came from before records based on their haplogroup. And so your tester, whoever that was, has a Berber Y DNA from the Mediterranean basin, which could be North Africa, Spain, and we would tie that together with your known family history. Where do you know that they come from? Where do you think they come from? What, what records can we find that would put them in any of those places, um, and who do they match? Where do their matches come from? Now, we do the same thing with mitochondrial DNA. In fact, the same tester has haplogroup, which is a clan, again, for mitochondrial DNA of C1C2. And this was very interesting to me because C1C2 is unquestionably Native American. And that means that your testers, Mothers, 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 mother, straight back through all mothers into infinity was Native American. And we can take the records of that person and see if we can tie them to a place. And in fact, I did that with the tester that you had. Um, that person gave me two grandparents. That's the only information I had about that person their two grandparents, and uh, I had their parents' name, but they only had two of their grandparents. And so I used records, and I used DNA together, and I tracked that line back to a place, and I'm, I apologize, I don't speak Spanish, but it looks like, I'm going to spell it for you, how's that? H-U-A-N-I-Q-U-E-O de Morales in Mexico. And that location is down in mid-western uh, Mexico and in the Mohican area, and it's M-I-C-H-O-A-C-A-N. And then I found baptism records there. And the baptism record matches a location within just a few miles of a full mitochondrial sequence match, an exact match of three other people who have the ancestor with the, of, with the name of Isabel Olea, O-L-E-A, Isabella Olea, born in 1542, according to the church records. So either she's your ancestor or you and those people and her share a common ancestor and she was Native American. And the 1542 date works with the history of the area because the Spanish conquistadors came through that part of Mexico, and uh, unfortunately they did what Spanish conquistadors did in Mexico. Uh, and after they basically overran the Native people, they converted them and they started baptizing them in the church. And the, the good news for genealogy is that the records go very far back. 
the church records do. And then they come forward in time. And those records and that church happen to be preserved. So we're very fortunate. And before that, we know of the history of the people in that area. And the history of the people in the area are very, is very interesting. Um, there's an indigenous group there that's known to have been, there's three of them, but the, the dominant group in that area was the Perhepecans, P-U-R-H-E-P-E-C-H-A-N-S. And those people, there was a female leader, a warrior, and she rallied 10,000 Native American people and marched against 500 Spaniards. And she won. That's wow. the history of your people. Wow. That's that's crazy. I know. I know. I know. So this is so cool because we were able to take the mitochondrial DNA and we were able to take the baptism records and we were able to get them within just a few miles of each other. And then we were able to find other people who have very early ancestors in that same area who match that DNA exactly. So we know we're in the right place and the right time. And, uh, and now that we know, you hopefully would be able to take the records that I found and then extend them back in those church records even further in time. And I wasn't able to uh, go all the way back with that information that I had uh, because I'm, uh, I, I ran into a problem with the Spanish records and the script and not being a native Spanish speaker. But you can find somebody to do that, or, um, or you know, there are genealogy companies that do that and, and people that specialize in that kind of thing. So we know that she was native, and this also ties in with the, the third kind of DNA, which is the autosomal. And remember I told you that autosomal DNA reaches, it's broad but not deep. So you can't go back like as many generations as we went back here. Um, gosh, you know, if, if, if 1542, there's roughly four generations per century. So, I mean, that's many, many generations back in time. But uh, autosomal DNA gets divided in each generation. So you can't do that. But what it does, though, is it lets you, um, you've inherited DNA from all four of your grandparents, all eight of your great-grandparents, 16 of your great-greats. So there's little pieces of each of these that get passed down to you, and we measure those and match them against people that you match. And your tester had, um, I think it was 42 mitochondrial DNA matches in total, but there's 40. 4,661 autosomal matches, and some are as close as second to fourth cousins, but there's other parts to that, too, and one of those at, at Family Tree DNA is called My Origins, and that's the ethnicity testing um, or population testing that um, you see advertised on TV or you did for a long time, and that's like, who am I? I'm going to take a DNA test and find out. Well, let me tell you, um, at an continental level, it's pretty accurate. But when you try and differentiate between, you know, England and Ireland and France and Spain and Germany and Holland, it's like trying to differentiate people that were born in Indiana and Illinois. I mean, if you look at the, at the, uh, the geography, Indiana and Illinois are bigger than some of those countries. So it's very difficult to tell within a continent um, that, you know, to the country level, and plus countries have their political entities anyway, and people moved around. They did back then, they still do today. So I looked at the my origins, the ethnicity for your tester. And your tester, as it turns out, was approximately 50% New World. By New World, I mean North and South America. And the balance was Iberian. Now, Iberia is Spain. The Iberian Peninsula is basically Spain and Portugal. Uh, but more specifically, there's a Basque area that's at the tip, the upper tip of Spain. And that's the area where the part that isn't native um, is, is showing as where they're from. And then there's about 5% that's Middle Eastern, which 
doesn't surprise me because if, if you um, recall what I said about the Berber haplogroup, um, that would all come from that Mediterranean area. So it's a it, the my origins information with Family Finder confirms what we found both in the DNA from the Y DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, and also the historical records that I was able to find. And all of these three things came together perfectly. Wow. And just to clarify for those listening, it was my uncle on my father's side who took the test because my dad didn't want to take it. But the reason why this whole thing comes up is because here in America, we're a melting pot nation. Everybody is from everywhere. And we're, you know, obviously a, a nation of immigrants. And in my particular family, we had our own oral history and our last name wasn't our last name. And that is common for a lot of people. Their last name is not their own. So it was really hard to research. It's easy to take a DNA test. But when it comes to the research portion, where do you even start at? Well, that's a really, really good question. So there's three places where you want to, where you can start. First of all, you want to talk to your family. So you want to get those oral, those oral history stories. You want to find your oldest family member, and then you want to talk to all the family members because they're going to have different tidbits. Grandma told somebody something different, or Grandpa told somebody something different, and you want to write them all down. And I know you're going to think that you remember them, and you don't. Write them down. Do yourself a favor. And also write down who told you, because in 20 years, you're not going to remember who told you that. So, so first of all, you start with what you have. And especially right now, because we're all, you know, social distancing, and we're doing Zoom, and we're doing these kind of things, take this opportunity to ask those questions, because you have a perfect a perfect opportunity to fill some of that time and to share those stories um, today. So first of all, we start with the oral history. Second of all, we start with what we have, and we all have DNA. Uh, everybody has autosomal DNA. Everybody has mitochondrial, and men have Y DNA. And I, I can't tell you many Y DNA tests I've bought for other people in my family because I don't carry the Y chromosome, but even if I did, like, I wanted my mother's father, so I found someone with the Fervida last name and, and bought a Y-DNA kit for them because I wanted the information. And, of course, I share it with them. And in fact, they manage their own kit. But, but the point is that I can't do the testing. So you start with what you have, the oral history. You start with what you have, your, the DNA. And then you start with records confirming the oral history. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way, like Grandpa's going to lie to you. I'm, I'm saying that because we have these, these legends, if you will, and, and I'm going to share with you one of mine because it wasn't true. It was that my father's grandmother was, do not laugh, a Cherokee princess. Everybody has these Cherokee princess stories in their family. And in our family, we even it was this one particular person. So when I found someone to do a, a, a mitochondrial DNA test, on that line, I was just sure it was going to come back native. And you know what? It's not. And I was just, I was just devastated because all these years I had believed that. And then when I got to digging in the records, I found her family. They're truly not native. I know where they came from. And I have several generations back now. But we, so we start with the oral history. We start with our DNA. And then we start building and using things like census and obituaries and just Google um, uh, for information sometimes. Other people have done research. And then we use uh, things like the records at MyHeritage and at Ancestry. And then FamilySearch has records for free. That's the Mormon Church. So there's all different kinds of ways that we can find records to confirm our oral history and our genetic history. And then we use all of those three to build our family tree. Now, here's, here's one. Don't laugh at me. Uh, in my family, a lot of people, I don't even know their real names. <laughs> so I'm not laughing. <laughs> it, it, it happens, though, right? I mean, you're like, oh, oh this, is, this is cousin, you know, Mousy. And it's mm -hmm. like, wait, what is Mousy's real name, though? I couldn't tell you offhand. But when it comes to that kind of stuff, even my, like, my grandfather, the names he would give me, they weren't accurate at all 
or maybe I was just spelling it wrong. (laughs) I couldn't figure it out. And I was getting kind of frustrated when searching for my family history because, you know, when growing up, they would say, oh, go to the library and you can go through the microfilms and you can go through books that are, that'll have stuff in there. And none of that exists anymore. So I, I was looking through forums and they kept talking about GED match, GED match. Yep. What is that? Is that something that people should look into? Well, GED match is a little different. Um, I, I'm going to take your question in two parts because it's really two questions, okay? So, for example, finding names finding people's names. One of the things I use is obituary because you can Google, especially if it's, you know, if you have any information, you can Google their name and a place or a part name or their parents' name or something. You know, you can also use things like Find a Grave, which is free. So there are resources for you to use um, to find information about names and people's names, even death certificates. And by the way, those aren't always accurate either. But what you start doing is you start like building a case, if you will. You take all different kinds of information. For example, this information that I was uh, on your uncle, I found one man's name spelled three different ways. I don't know how it's really spelled, but, you know, spelling wasn't even standardized at one point. Uh, Women often went by middle names especially people, German and Spanish people, they often went by their middle names because their first name was a saint name. So there's all different kinds of things like that. So now let's move to GEDmatch. Um, We talked earlier about the four testing companies. Those are companies that are well-known, respected, ethical, that do testing of your DNA, and two of them also provide records, genealogical records that you can subscribe to separately from having your DNA tested. GEDmatch is, is, a, is a reverse of that. They don't do DNA testing, and they don't have records like census and, and uh, death records and things like that, but they have additional tools, genealogical tools, um, genetic genealogy tools that you can use that the other places don't have. So it was started about 15 years ago by two genealogists that were frustrated, and uh, for example, Ancestry doesn't provide segment information, but if you tested Ancestry, you can transfer to GEDmatch or MyHeritage or Family Tree DNA. You can transfer your DNA there, and you can then get your segment information to match against other people who are in those databases. So there's tools for people who um, understand this after they kind of get their feet wet in other places that are more advanced that uh, are available at GEDmatch. Now, one of the things I've noticed as when I was going through Family Tree DNA's site is they had like a little like policy thing like, hey, don't transfer your DNA. Like this is your information. Is this like a social security number? Should I not be giving it out willy nilly to anybody? That's a really good question um, because it depends. (laughs) (laughs) Um, In a sense, yes. And in another sense, Maybe not. So so let's talk about that. First of all, I think the reason they have that, and I can't speak for them, obviously, but, you know, like and on McDonald's, it says, on the coffee cup, it says, this coffee is hot, you can burn yourself? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, they're telling you that if you transfer your DNA out of their company, and every single company has this, by the way, they're not alone, every company where you test it, where you can transfer your DNA, tells you on the way out the door, you're removing this from our umbrella. We are not responsible. You are responsible for whatever you do with it. We're not, you know, it's not under our protection anymore. So they're not any different than any other company in the fact that they do that. So so number one. But let's take the other part of your question, the is it dangerous? If you are working within the ethical companies, um, the testing companies that we've mentioned, GEDmatch, and some other third-party tools that I write about on my blog that are known within the industry, we know who owns them, we know they're legitimate, we know where they, you know, their business headquarters are. Those companies, I don't have any concern about whatsoever with anything untoward happening. Now, what do I mean by untoward? I think that you have the right to know what your DNA is being used for and where it is. Now, even though they don't have your actual DNA, they only have the results of that test. So they only have like, you know, 700,000 markers of your several 
million billion sites, DNA locations, still it's yours. And, and if you send it to them to use for something for you, then that's what it should be used for. And so that's why you need to know where the company is located. You know, are they ethical? Do the people, the influencers in this community that have been around for 20 years, do we say, yeah, they're fine, or do we kind of, you know, kind of give you the side eye and go, well, you might really want to think about that, uh, because maybe that's not a good thing to do. So, you know, your, the rule of thumb is if you go to my website and you put that company name in and you do not find them, consider that the side eye. And if you find them and I've written about them, whatever I've written is about the company. Some are wonderful. Some are like, that's okay. Uh, and then people sometimes say, have you heard of this company? Will you write about it? And if I really haven't heard of them or, you know, maybe I need to write about it, I will. But um, this consider them unvetted if they're not there. So that's kind of what I would say about that. Do you think in the future you can sell your own DNA information? I mean, make money off of it, right? Well, two of the companies today um, do actually, if, if you, at 23andMe and Ancestry, if you consent, they do sell your DNA information for um, medical or other research. What they don't do is tell you where it is and what it's being used for, uh, which I personally I have not opted into that for that reason. But everybody has the right to make their own decisions. There um, was a co couple of companies that did that for a while, but the problem is is that uh, you had to sign up for, let's say, uh, I said, okay, I'll sign up for a breast cancer uh, research. Um, because my mother had breast cancer. She didn't. I'm just giving this as an example, okay? So I'm signing up for breast cancer research. Well, by the time that they, you know, they try and vet everybody, they could just go to 23andMe and Ancestry and just say, I want to buy 100,000 of these and not have to deal with every person one at a time. So that platform did not work well because of the fact that any company or any place that wants to garner a large number of these can do so in one fell swoop without having to deal with the consumers individually. Oh, that is kind of so, scary. So I guess the answer is, yeah, you could, but I just don't, I don't think that's going to work well. Yeah. I mean, they just come in, take it and they don't, I mean, if I'm not getting paid off of my information, I kind of feel like this is a one-sided deal. I felt that way too. So there's two sides to this. I'm going to, since we're talking about it, I'm going to tell you what both sides are. Uh, I already told you how I feel, but I'm going to tell you what the other side is. Let's say that they're talking about, you know, Parkinson's disease. And I'm all, I am all for finding a cure to Parkinson's. I'm all for finding a cure to cancer. I'm all for finding a cure to COVID. Believe me, I'm all for that. And when I thought it was going to, you know, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and it was a nonprofit, I was all fine. And when I found out that the companies were making as much money as I paid, so I pay them for the testing and then they sell it for that much again, and how many times to how many people, and they're using it for I don't know what or where, I have an issue with that. So I... You know, there are some people who opt in and they're absolutely fine with that and they don't care what's done with it, and that's fine for them. I have a different opinion, and that's fine for me. But the, the good news is that everybody gets to make their own choices. Well, Roberta, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. For those listening, where can they find out about more information about you? Oh, I'm at my blog, which is www.dnaexplained.com. Uh, you can sign up for my blog there. It's my website, and there's tools. There's all kinds of information. Um, I'm hitting my eighth year of blogging here in another couple of weeks, and there's like 1,300 articles. So use the keyword search if you're looking for a topic and um, make a comment, ask questions. Um, that's what I'm there for. Thank you for inviting me to join you and, uh, and talk about this. It's a fascinating field. There's so much science and so much, and even though – it seems like we're 20 years into it. We're still at the tip of the iceberg of what we can learn. And we make new discoveries every day. This has been the Mason Vera Payne Show. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to hear more? Head to WGNRadio.com for exclusive content by Mason. Also, follow Mason on Facebook and Twitter at Mason Vera Payne. That's all one word. 
And don't forget to share the show with your friends. 